I want to welcome you guys to, to Transformation again. We are in a series, and we're actually land, speaking of planes, there it is. We're landing the plane on our series, right, called Growing in Grace. And uh, how many, has this been a good series for you guys? It's been really great uh, yeah. just for me and, and seeing us grow towards where God wants us to be. I want to take us to our core scripture this morning, 2 Peter 3, 18. And this is what it says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Thank you, Cody. Amen. Oh, that's good. Praise the Lord. All right. So, you know, we kicked off the series with uh, what I call the tools for a graceful life. And we talked about... Uh, in, you know, in, in verse 3, we establish that God has given us what? Everything we need for life and godliness, right? What has He given us? Everything. Everything we need for life and for godliness. So, and if we tap into His divine power, right, it helps us to walk into His divine nature, right? That was week one. The tools we need for a graceful life. So secondly, that part two, we talked about the foundation for a graceful life. How important God's Word is to us. How important it is to our lives in walking out uh, this graceful life. And uh, we talked about if we believed in the scripture, are we modeling the scripture to everyone around us? And is our foundation on the scripture strong and stable? Amen? So that was week two. Week three, that was last week, we took a little detour out of Second Peter and we journeyed into the land of Oz. Who was here last week? That was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, that was neat. And we used the scarecrow, the tin man, and the lion to look at the three obstacles that we can face on our journey to grow in grace. And then there were three obstacles we talked about. Fa the failure mentality, what I call heart attack, uh, unable to receive love, express love, and then the fear factor, dealing with uh, feeling incapable of accomplishing God's desires. But how many know... If God is for us, who can stand against us? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And so we serve a good God who's there to love us, protect us, give us strength, and empower us to accomplish what God's called us to do. Amen. 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 So this week, as we land the plane, we're back in 2 Peter chapter 3. And this week, we're going to be talking about the question for a grace-filled life. The question for a grace-filled life. So uh, as we jump into this, Peter is laying out a clear warning to the church about the day of the Lord and as the church what our response should be. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3 beginning with verse 3 and, and we're going to read down through 13 so hang with me okay. Uh, it's on the screen for you if you didn't bring your Bible with you. So here we go verse 3. Above all you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of the water and by the water. And by water, sorry. By these waters also the world, the world of that time was delu uh, deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow to keep in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness, Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements, you hear the roar right there? <laughs> elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives 
as you look forward to the day of, of the Lord, the day of God, and speed its coming, that the day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Can anybody say amen? Amen. You know what? For thousands of years now, humanity has been contemplating, questioning, and even denying the, the, the validity of a reoccurring biblical theme, the return of the Lord. So here in chapter 3, Peter's letter is bringing the return of Christ back to the thoughts of the church. And he's warning them again of what is to come and that they need to be ready. And they say there in verse 3 that the scoffers will come. Look back again at verse 3. It says, above all, you must understand that in the last days, the scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And they'll say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it, as it has since the beginning of creation. Let me just define to you real quick what a scoffer is. Not a term we use every single day, but I want you to know what that is. Someone who jeers, mocks, or treat something with contempt or calls out in desertion. Treat something with contempt. You know, at one point or another, if you call yourself a Christian, you're going to come up against someone who doesn't agree with your faith. And he calls into question whether God's word is true or not. You believe that's true? Amen. I mean, he's speaking to that right now. So Peter is talking... Uh, to the church about this situation. Now, how many know that this was probably not relegated just to that century, to the first century? It, it wasn't because they're doing it today. Yes. They're doing it today. They, they've done it for a long time. I, I remember as a kid, um, I, you, when, I, when I was a kid, my dad was a pastor in a church that was right on the corner of the high school property. Okay, like our church sat adjacent to it. And everybody knew our church because, one, we were the only Assembly of God church, the only Pentecostal church in the city. Okay, so everybody knew who I was and everybody knew who my dad was because, we, one, we were right there and then we were that church. If you know what I'm talking about. We were that church. Now, I had a really strong youth pastor. He really pumped us up. He challenged us to share the gospel, to share our faith, to be Christ wherever we, we, we go. And so I would go to school. I would go to school with my Bible in my hand. And I found a lot of opposition. Anybody else experience something like that? A lot of opposition. And so I would try to be Christ. I would try to share my faith. I would try to do what God's called me to do. But what I found is that I got a lot of kickback. I'd get a bit of scoffing, if I can use that term. I'd get a little bit of jeering. I'd get a little bit made fun of. And so they gave me a nickname. <coughs> they called me Preacher Boy. That's what they called me. Uh, and and I, for some, I thought it was an affectionate name, but actually it wasn't an affectionate name. They were mocking me. They were scoffing at me. And though I was sincere in my heart... I was being made fun of. How many know that that's something that could happen when you're sharing your faith? And it's something that was happening in that first century church. As they were telling the people all around, they were spreading the gospel, telling the good news about Jesus, saying, He's going to come back again. And they would keep saying, but you keep saying this. You keep saying this, but everything stays the same. We keep waking up. We keep going to work. We keep having fun. Nothing seems, he never seems to come. You keep saying he's coming. There's time and place for us to understand that we have to hold fast to faith. You believe that this morning? You have to hold fast to what you believe and what God's word says. You're going to come up against opposition. You're going to come up against people that aren't going to agree. Are we going to stand? Whole, are we, we say that this morning. I'm going to stand with arms high and heart abandoned. Is that going to be the people we are? Amen. We're asking a question this morning. It's a question 
for grace verse 5. Verse 5 through 7. And what we're going to do right now, we're going to talk about two different things. The scriptures say something, they say this, what they deliberately forget. And then later in verse 8, it says what we must never forget. So right now, I want us to look at verse 5. And we're, going to, we're breaking down the scripture a little bit today. So I want you to, to, to just uh, digest this as we go. Here's what it says in verse, beginning of verse 5. But they deliberately forgot. Say deliberately. Deliberately. How many mean that? No, that means on purpose. Okay, they did it on purpose. They forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed by the same word that presents heavens and earth are reserved for fire, but kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now, I've got to tell you, this is a, maybe a newsflash to you, but people haven't changed much. You know, it's amazing to me how you can look at nature, you can look at the world we live in, you can see satellite imagery from the space station of our, the, the beautiful world God created for us. You can see the intricacies of the seven wonders. You can see uh, the Grand Canyon and how beautiful and marvelous these things are, and yet we can say there is no God. This is the world we're, we're at. It's in our faces, yet they don't believe. And this is what it says in Romans 1, 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His uh, eternal power and divine nature have been have been clearly seen, clearly seen, being understood from what was been uh, what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Guys, we we live in a world that screams there is a God. Amen. It Amen. screams there is a God. Amen. If you if you look at the mountaintops, if you look at the valleys, if you look at the oceans, if you look at the beautiful skies, if you look at the animals all over our world, you can see very clearly there is a design to our world. Yes. And your people still deliberately now in 2017 still say that this stuff would just happen. It just happened. Like someone accidentally made the world. It just accidentally fell out of the ocean or, or grew some leg. That is <laughs> poppycock. Can I use that term? Good <laughs> grief. The beauty and the glory of our world. And it's so obvious. There was this, you know, you get, you get taken back by it. There's a story that Pastor Chuck would tell you. He took his family to see the Grand Canyon. Now, how many have seen the Grand Canyon in real life? Not a lot of hands. i got to do this so I can see you. Not a lot of hands. There's several hands. I've seen it in pictures. I've seen it in books. I've seen it where you fold it out, and it's like, wow, that's amazing. But Pastor Chuck said he, he, he'd never been, so he, he went took his family to the Grand Canyon, and he walked up to it. And you're kind of blown away by the majesty of this thing. It's enormous. It's, it's, it's just you can indescribable. And so he was so overwhelmed with what he was seeing, he began to sing. Help me out, Stan. Y'all remember what he said? How great thou art. At the, at the top of his lungs, right there, in front of God and everybody, with tears rolling down his face. Why? Because he began to see the DNA of our God, of our King, of our Creator before him. There was something that overwhelmed him. And I believe our, our world has become underwhelmed. And this was what was happening here. He's trying to tell them there in, in, uh, in 2 Peter. He's saying, they're going to scoff. They're going to say, where is your God? But here it is. Look around. Look at the beauty of our world. You know, we've been talking about, we've been talking about Christ's return for thousands of years. We've been talking about it and talking about it. We've been saying there's a God. We've been saying there's a King. We've been saying that Christ is coming. But every year comes and goes. And it doesn't change, it does not change the fact that Christ will return. But listen, the delay 
challenges our faith and gives fuel to those who would ask for proof of his return. You say that's true? It's true. This is something that the early church was battling with just as much as we battle with it today. So Peter goes on to instruct us in verse 8, and it says this. this is, now, this is what they said in verse 5, what they deliberately forget. They forget that the world was created by God. They, they forget. They look around and they just close their eyes and go, I don't see the beauty. I don't see the creation. This is what the Lord says to us. He says, this is what you should never forget. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow to keep His promise. What is, what is He saying here? What is, what is Peter trying to inject into our lives in this moment? He's saying, God is bigger and greater and stronger and has more magnitude than you can ever even imagine to the point where He, he steps through the time barrier. He breaks the time barrier. Uh, he 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 takes he takes the DeLorean and he can go back to the future and back. I mean, he can do what he wants to do. And so for us, how dare we stand and say there is no God? How dare we say when well, we can't understand who our God is because He is greater, He is stronger, He is higher? It says the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. As, as some understand slowness, they're like, what's going on? Why? Why in the world has he not done this yet? You know, he's been talking about Jesus coming back. He's been talking about the things that he's going to do on the earth. I've read Revelation like 60 times. When all that stuff is going to happen? And so this is what it says. He's not slow in keeping his promise. Instead, he's patient with us. He's patient with us. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What he's saying there, listen. God knows exactly what He's doing. Amen. Now this is where we as a people have to trust God. We have to trust Him to say, God, I would love it if you came today. How many would love it if Jesus came back right now? Wouldn't it be great? It would be great because we'd be standing face to face with Jesus our Savior. We'd be in eternity with Him. But, 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 there's always a big but. How many people would we leave behind? How many people would we not been able to tell about Jesus? How many people would, would spend eternity in hell? And this is what it's saying. He's saying right here, he's, he's not slow in keeping his promise. He is going to accomplish it. He's patient because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but that everyone can come to repentance. You know, I think for some of us, we, we just, I say we, some, that we, we really just try, we put our own humanity on God. Anybody ever thought about that? We put our thought process on God, and we think that, you know, God must be lazy. He must just be slow. He just must not, he needs a little more time. But the truth of the matter is, God knows exactly what he's doing. And the reason that there's a delay, the reason that he's not already sent Christ, one, there's an appointed time. He knows exactly when he's going to do that. But the, one of the reasons he's delaying is because there's still so many people that need to know about Jesus. Amen. There's so many people that you work with and I work with that we... Now, I'm, I'm, hopefully everybody I work with is saved. <laughs> that I come in contact with at the grocery store or I rub shoulders with when I'm picking up Subway or whatever it is. He's saying, I'm giving you more time so you can tell them about Jesus. I'm giving you more time so you can share my love with them. There's people that need to be saved and set free. There's people that need to be healed. There's people that need to know about me. This is why I delay. This is why I hold back. Amen. Because God desires that everyone has a chance to receive Christ. The delay of His return is a chance for us to enact His will on the earth. And it's an opportunity for someone who hasn't heard to hear and be saved. That's why. That's what he's saying. So in verse 10, as we move on, this is what it says. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid to bear when I was a kid, excuse me for saying. When I was a kid, 
Sunday night was hellfire and brimstone night at church. Anybody? I, I, that seemed to be a reoccurring theme. My dad was our pastor. My, man, I, I'm just a segue for a second. My dad is an amazing preacher. I'm just let you know. And I'm going to get him here uh, so you guys can hear. He is an evangelist, and he gets to spend every single day seeing people come into the kingdom. It's a really amazing thing. But dad... He was that, he would get real passionate. He would get red in the face. That vein would pop up on his head like that. And he would pound that thing. And he would, you know what I'm saying? Because he was passionate about seeing people come to God. He was passionate about people escaping uh, an eternal damnation and separation from God. Sleeping under the pew, sitting, listening in the pew. Uh, and hearing that day in, or Sunday, every Sunday night. And I remember, as long as I can remember, I would hear about the coming of the Lord. And, and it put, as a child, it put fear in my heart. Because Dad would talk about Jesus coming back. He would talk about the rapture of the church. And he would say, you got to be ready. you got to be ready. And I would be, I want to be ready. But I knew I was a bad kid in my head. You know, I was like, I'm so terrible. I lied to my mom. And I didn't, I didn't make my bed. And, you know, I'm going to hell. You know, because, you know, that's how you think when you're a kid. And so I would hear Dad preaching, and I got saved every single Sunday. You ever done that? Coming in, oh man, I messed up, I gotta get right. That, that, that's a, actually a terrible thing to do. Uh, always having a repentant heart, it's actually really good. But what I found is that as a child growing up, this was ingrained into my life. We, they had movies. Anybody remember the movies? Uh, what was it called? They had this whole series of movies that were like shot in the 70s or something. It was called A Thief in the Night. Anybody heard of these? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Um, they were Image of the Beast, <coughs> A Distant Thunder, and The Prodigal Planet. And it was all about the tribulation. It was all about what, you, like, what you're going to go through. And it was really badly made. You know what I'm saying? It was like the 70s bell bottoms, a huge, you know... <laughs> And, uh, but it still had such an impact on my life. It's still ingrained in my head. But here's what I found. We don't talk about the rapture and the coming of the Lord much anymore. You know, I talk, we talk, I talk about this with my kids. And there's not that same level or healthy fear of the coming of the Lord. Because I, wanted, I didn't want to get left. I could tell story after story where I would come home... Nobody would be there. All the cars were there. All the lights were on. And I'm going, I've missed it. I missed it. I have missed it. God, I'm going, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to go hide in the jungle. I'm going to have to go into a cave. I'm not taking the mark. They're going to cut off my head. You know what I'm saying? All these things. And then mom walks around the corner and like, oh, hey. <laughs> you know, just like, I'm crying. I thought you were gone. I thought it was a rapture. You know, uh, recently they've, they've attempted to uh, make some movies that talk about the, you know, the rapture and people uh, being taken up. You know, the, there was the uh, Kirk Cameron one several, I don't know, like 15 years ago, whatever it was. Those weren't too bad. And then recently they did a Left Behind movie with Nicolas Cage. And, and, but what, I, what I'm appreciative of is that there is a, a kind of a resurgence of let's tell people that Jesus is coming back. It, that, that, that's so important that we tell this, this very materialistic, all about me uh, culture that there's more to life than just you. And there's more to life that God's called us to more. And so, but nobody ever talked about it. But here, he's talking about it. And he's telling them that the day is going to come and it's going to come like a thief. You're not even going to realize it. It's going to be there. We're talking about a question this morning. We're being asked a question as we step through the down the road uh, as a, uh, to, to, to walk out this grace-filled life. We're being asked a question. A question that's so necessary to us as a church. Because if we don't get the question right, there's no telling how many people are not going to be impacted by the gospel. In verse 11, it says here, 
Well, I'm going to talk about verse 11 in just a second. But this is what it says. If, at, if, at, uh, if as Jesus said, we cannot know the hour of the day, right? He said that. You're not going to know the day of the hour. Right. Yet we also see the signs. How are we to be both ready to go and resigned to wait? So listen, this goes back a few, a few scriptures. It says this, according to the Apostle Peter, the scoffers say, right? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning. But he reminds us that the day of the Lord, the, the, the Lord's delay means salvation for more, right? Still, Peter poses the question. Here's the question for us all this morning. What kind of people ought you to be? Now, that's in light of everything that's come before in the Scriptures. Everything we just read through, okay? In light of all of that, the greatness of our God, those that would speak against God, uh, the day of the Lord that would come, the greatness and the magnitude of our God, in light of all of these things and the return of the Lord, what type of people, what kind of people ought we to be? The church. He's talking to us. And this is what it says. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. Looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Let me read you a story. Uh, this is a story from Wendy uh, Murray. You probably don't even know who Wendy Murray is. But let me read this to you because it's really awesome. As we look forward, okay? When, uh, this is her speaking, when our middle son Ben was much younger, he had heard more than one sermon about the importance of surrendering our lives to Christ. Ben seemed well attuned to the heart of God. He exhibited the selfless and kind tendencies that would take some, like his parents, a lifetime of, of sanctification to acquire. So, it disturbed he, she says, my husband and me, when Ben uh, stubbornly resisted our invitations for him to give his life to Christ. He would offer no expl explanation. He would simply tell us in his preschool English that he wasn't ready. He resisted for several months. Then one morning, as we sat around the kitchen table eating Cheerios, little Ben announced that he was ready to give his life to Christ. And then he got up from the table, and he went upstairs. And she says, my husband and I looked at each other very, very puzzled, and we followed him. And they, she says, I guess we expected to find Ben kneeling next to his bed, praying and asking the Lord to come into his life. But that's not what they found. Instead, we found him folding his Star Wars pajamas into his Sesame Street suitcase. And we said, Ben, what are you doing? And he answered, I'm packing. Why? They asked. To go to heaven. We then understood why our child hesitated to give his life to Christ for so long. He thought that in doing so, he would have to leave us and take up residence literally with Christ in heaven. We should all possess the faith of little Benjamin. We should have our hearts so fixed on Christ's appearance that the attachments of our earthly life pale in comparison. Listen to this. Hebrews 11, 13 says, For we are aliens and we're strangers on earth, longing for a better country and a heavenly one. Listen, guys, I want to talk just at the end here. I want to answer the question. We need to answer the question for us as a church, and individually this morning, what kind of people ought we to be as you look forward to the day of the Lord? We need to come to a place where we're willing to surrender our earthly possessions, our earthly life. <coughs> Little Ben's mentality is perfect because are we that ready and secure to say, here it is, Lord, take me now. Are we there in that place to be able to say, I am secure in my life and in my salvation to say, God, take me as I stand. And to know this, that it's not, it's not going to happen just like that. Because in the tearing, in the waiting, God has a mission for you and I. 
He has a mission for you and I to accomplish this morning. Because it's okay for us to look forward to. How many have ever looked forward to? I looked forward to going home. I looked forward to eating turkey. I looked forward to watching football. Even though I don't like football. I, li I enjoy watching people watch football. But, but you look forward to it. And i got to ask you this morning, are you so happy? Are we so happy here on earth that we are looking forward to his return? It's a question that I need you to ponder inside of your heart. It's a question I need all of us to think about this morning. What kind of people ought we to be? He answers this there in verse 12. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day. Listen, this morning, we need to assess ourselves and say, Lord, am I walking in holiness? Am I walking in a godly lifestyle as I look forward to your return? I want you to ask yourself that this morning. Would you close your eyes, bow your heads with me this morning? I want you to ask this of yourself. Am I looking forward to his return? Am I looking forward to the day that Jesus comes again? Is there anything inside of my life right now that would keep me from looking forward to? Is there sin in my life? Is there bitterness in my life? Is there resentment in my life? Am I holding on against my brother? Is there something I need to lay at the feet of Jesus this morning? What kind of people ought we to be in the light of the day of the Lord approaching quickly? We need to be about our Father's business this morning. And are you ready for His return? That's the question I posed this morning. Are you ready? Is Jesus the Savior of your life? Is He the Redeemer of your soul this morning? Have you surrendered everything to Him this morning? Are you ready for the return of the Lord? If you're in this place right now, you say, I'm not ready. Just straight up. No, I I'm not going to pull any punches. And you're in this place, you say, Pastor Michael, I'm not ready to see the Lord. There's things in my life that don't line up. And I need to give my life to the Lord today. I, I want to be ready. If you're in this place, you say, Pastor Michael, I, I want to be ready. I want to give my life to the Lord. I want to redeem what, what, what I've given away to the enemy. I want to redeem it and give it to the Lord and to be used for what's good. Anybody today who would say, I'm ready. I want to be ready this morning. So I take it everybody's saved. Everybody's got their life straight and on the right path. And I'm so glad. So this morning at that question, I want you to ponder. As a Christ follower, are we walking in holiness? And are we walking in godliness? With the return of the Lord on our mind. Right now, I want to challenge all of you. As you stand to your feet. And I want you to lift your hands. And I want you to receive from the Lord this morning. Come on, everybody stand to your feet. Because God says, I want to utilize you for my mission. I have plans for you, plans to see you prosper and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. And there's so many right now that need a hope and a future. And they need you in the tarrying, in the waiting, as we wait on the Lord to come, that we are doing what He's called us to do. So Lord, this morning I pray, would you begin to instruct us Challenge us. Give us courage this morning to walk in a holy lifestyle, to walk in a godly lifestyle, and to share the good news of the return of the Lord with those around us this morning. Thank you, God, for the opportunity as you delay that we would see souls come into the kingdom, we would see lives transformed, and that we would see newness of life spreading across the city. Do it right now, God. Challenge us again. Second Peter 3, 17, it says, But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. God, we want to walk in grace. We want to continually be growing in that grace. As we follow your word, as you've given us the tools, fill up our tool belt, God. Fill up our tool belt, God.
as we grow in grace today. Lord, help us to stand firmly on the Scriptures, God. Lord, help us to get past any obstacles, Father. And help us to answer the question, what type of people ought we to be? A people that live holy and godly lives. God, I thank you for what you're doing in transformation. I thank you for the lives that you're setting free. Now do it again as we go from this place. As we impact the lives around us. As we are your hands and your feet, God. Help us to see impact in the city. Help us to see lives come into the kingdom. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Do you agree with that this morning? Can we give God a high praise? Woo! It happens through you and yeah, you and right. you and me. So every person we come in contact with, every person we see, we need to see them through the light of eternity. See them the way Jesus sees them. And this is what he says. This is the truth of how Jesus sees every single person. So say it with me. Everyone has a name. Everyone has a story. And everyone is loved by God. And because of Jesus, come on, say it. I am alive and strong. Amen. Come on, give me praise. Amen. Now I want you to go out and I want you to implement that to every person you see, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus and his soon and coming return. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys as you go today. If you want to stay popcorn in the pastor's happening right now, right after service. Thanks for being here today.